Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in. And now we'll continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. Yesterday, at the end of the broadcast, we were talking about Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, and what role he played, if any, in the creation or justification of what is now known as the patrimony of Peter, or the temporal power of the Pope, the kingly power of the Pope. Did Constantine, the so-called first Christian emperor in the Roman Empire, did he confer any power, any kingly power upon the papacy? That's the question that the author is dealing with now. You know, the Jesuits, and together with the papacy, have contrived many artful uh, justifications for this so-called patrimony of Peter, the temporal power of the Pope, the power to persecute, the power to rule the kings of the earth, but all of them are false. And one of the most artful contributions of the Jesuit order is the so-called donation of Constantine that somehow Constantine donated his jurisdiction, his power, and his temporal authority to the Pope when he left Rome and went to Constantinople. This is called the donation of Constantine, and together with other artful contravations of the Jesuits and the, and the papacy, they claim this temporal power. Now, people might roll their eyes and say, well, what is he talking about, this temporal power of the Pope? What significance has this for me? Well, if through the donation of Constantine, the Pope has gained kingly power or a divine right to rule over the kings of the earth, then the papacy is controlling your government. Your elected officials have to answer to the divine right king of the world, the Pope. And I assert here at Inquisition Update that's precisely what they're doing. Both Democratic and Republican politicians are pressured constantly, decade in and decade out, to more and more conform the nation of the United States, the Constitution and its laws, to be consistent with the theory of papal supremacy. And that little by little, this country is being made Catholic. Both the, the, the politicians of the country and the ecumenical pastors and religious leaders of this country are working together with the Roman Catholic Church to unite this country in support of this, this farce of biblical proportions called the papacy. Now, we're dealing specifically with Constantine. The Emperor Constantine, the so-called first Christian emperor of the Roman Empire, and he ended persecution of the Christians, and he made Christianity the, holy, the religion of the Holy Roman Empire. So he gets credit for being a Christian. Let's, let's talk about this and see what really is the foundation of this so-called temporal power of the Pope. It says that Constantine recognized the church at Rome as an existing ecclesiastical corporation, as some of his predecessors had done, is unquestionably true. And oh, by the way, before we continue, if you're following along in your book, we're on page 250, the first full paragraph down about the middle of the page that Constantine recognized the Church of Rome as an existing ecclesiastical corporation, as some of his predecessors had done, is unquestionably true. And it is also true that he went further than any of them in strengthening and protecting it, that is, the Roman Catholic Church. He is called the Christian Emperor by way of distinction. But when we shall come at another place to look into the history of his connection with the Roman clergy, we shall find that his only claim to this title consists in the fact that he was the friend and patron of the ecclesiastical organization 
which gave him its support when he marched his army from Britain and Gaul into Italy to supplant the reigning emperor and seize upon the empire. So the Roman Catholic Church supported Constantine when he gathered up his forces to overthrow the existing government of, of uh, the empire. And the Roman Catholic, he found a friend in the Roman Catholic Church that wanted to overthrow. So, in a sense, you can call this Roman Catholic Church and Constantine uh, a usurpation right from the very beginning. Okay? Now, I'm not defending the existing government of Rome. I'm just showing the rightful place that the Roman Catholic Church, together with Constantine, should be, should be held in the minds of God's people. Okay, and when we're talking about the legitimacy of the papacy as king of kings and lord of lords in the world, it's important to look at its very beginnings. And it was an unholy relationship between Constantine and the Roman Catholic Church that together helped overthrow the existing government of the Roman Empire. This the author makes clear. Now he says the pretext that on his way to Rome as a pagan prince, that's right, he was pagan, he was not Christian when he overthrew the Roman Empire. The, the pretext that on his way to Rome as a pagan prince, he saw a flaming cross in the heavens bearing the inscription, quote, under this sign thou shalt conquer, unquote, answered its end in a superstitious aid, age, but is scarcely entitled to the place it has received in history. The fact is, he cared very little for Christianity beyond the use to which he put its professors, which was to build up and secure his own power. In other words, his, his alignment with the, 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 the religious leaders of the Roman Catholic Church in Rome was a matter of expedience. You know, the, en the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend type of thing. It was, a, it was not a Christian association between Constantine, a pagan, and the so-called Christian church at Rome, which was never Christian from the beginning, despite what this author claims later in the book. Now, although he convened the first council of Nice, we're speaking again of Constantine, although he convened the first council of Nice, that is Nicaea, as some pronounce it, dictated the most material part of its creed and made it the measure of orthodoxy by his imperial decree, yet he deferred his own baptism and union with the Roman Church until just before his death in 337 A.D. when he received baptism at the hands of an Arian, an apostate, a heretic, and an heretical bishop. He was therefore never a Roman Catholic at all, but according to the present teachings of that church, was always a heretic and not a Christian, unless a man can possess both characters at the same time. His motives were in the main worldly, and hence, in deference, uh, the inference is unavoidable that what he did for the church at Rome was done chiefly to advance his own ambition. He had the sympathy of the Roman clergy, who were quite willing to assist him in expelling Maxentius, not only because the latter was a cruel and licentious prince, but in return for the privileges that Constantine conferred upon them. And as they were most efficient and valuable aids to each other, these privileges were both important and extensive. But it can in no be properly said that they were to the extent of conferred upon the Bishop of Rome as the head of the church or any share of the temporal power which, as all reliable history shows, he was careful to retain in his own hands both at Rome and elsewhere throughout the empire. By a royal decree, he commanded all his subjects to honor the Christian religion. He revoked all acts of persecution against Christians that had been proclaimed by his predecessors. He released Christians who had been deprived of their liberty. 
he placed him in an important post of the government at Rome. He commanded that part of the funds collected from tributary countries, in other words, those countries that paid taxes to Rome, should be paid over to the clergy. So there's, there's the state-sponsored religion. There's the tax-supported religion. Roman Catholicism was publicly supported by the taxpayers of the Roman Empire by Constantine. Constantine gave over tax money to help support this church. And that's a precedent that the Roman Catholic Church claims even today, that it should be a state-sponsored religion and that it should be financed and supported by tax dollars, by unbelievers, by those like me who would never set foot in a Roman Catholic Church and call it a Christian church. But they would tax me and they would use my tax money to help pay the priests. Okay? That this was a precedent set by uh, uh, Constantine. Now, I didn't mean to depart, but I just didn't, wanted to make the point. Now, he commanded that part of the funds collected from tributary uh, countries should be paid over to the clergy. He built and ornamented churches and he permitted litigants to appeal to the bishops instead of the secular courts if they preferred it. Okay? There's the establishment of the ecclesiastical courts. Okay? And it says Eusebius was preserved... Uh, Eusebius has preserved several of his edicts in reference to the church, that is, Constantine's edicts in reference to the church, and not one of them, however, confirms any temporal power or recognizes any previously existing. One of them distinctly ignores all such power in the Bishop of Rome. The first commands the restoration of certain church property. The second is of like character. The third convenes a council of bishops at Rome to preserve the unity and peace of the church. And the fourth convenes another council for the same purpose. In these two last... He provides by imperial edict for matters exclusively belonging to the church. When, if the temporal power had truly belonged to the bishop of Rome, they would have been within his sole jurisdiction. Why should Constantine thus act independently of ecclesiastical authority upon such a subject? Undoubtedly, it must have been only on the ground of his own imperial supremacy in spiritual as well as temporal affairs. That's right. Constantine was in charge. There was no temporal power conferred upon any Roman Catholic bishop. Now, it says he was willing to confer honor upon the church and emoluments upon the clergy, but determined that both the church and the clergy should be held in subordination to the state. Otherwise, what would he as emperor have to do with church unity? He was not a member of the church, according to the orthodox standard of the Roman church, not even a Christian. Manifestly, he must have felt his superiority over all the Roman hierarchy, even in the affairs of the, of the church, when in one of his edicts he used such language as this in reference to them. Quote, Hence it has happened that those very persons who ought to exhibit a brotherly and peaceful uni unanimity rather disgracefully and detestably, are at variance with one another, and thus give this occasion of derision to those who are without. In other words, those outside of the church are looking at the church and shaking their heads, wagging their fingers, shame, 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 for the way these morons are behaving. And it says, "...whose minds are averse to our own most holy religion." Hence, it has appeared necessary to me to provide that this matter, which ought to have ceased after the decision was issued by their own voluntary agreement, should be fully terminated by the intervention of many, unquote. The expression, our most holy religion, used by Constantine, was used here not in such a sense as signified his own personal faith, but to indicate what all the facts prove, 
that as the imperial head of the state, he considered himself also the imperial head of the church, and that this was his idea, if there were otherwise any doubt about it, is shown by another edict preserved by Eusebius, wherein he expressly separates the clergy from all temporal affairs by exempting them from all further secular service. And this is the reason he assigns, that they may not, quote, be drawn away from the service due the divinity, but rather may devote themselves to their proper law without any molestation, unquote. Insofar, therefore, as the general history of Constantine's administration of public affairs is concerned, there's no contemporaneous history to show that he recognized any temporal power in the hands of the Bishop of Rome. On the contrary, the assumption that he did seems so utterly groundless as to leave no room for further discussion. The further pretense that by actual imperial donation, he made over Rome and Italy to the popes, that is, he handed them over, they hand, that he handed over Rome and Italy to the popes in this so-called donation of Constantine, had its origin in the fertile brain of Pope Adrian I, who in order to obtain important concessions from Charlemagne, doubtless considered it necessary to impress him with the belief that he would, by granting them, be following the example of Constantine. And we covered this, and this was the exact same assertion made by Peter de Rosa in his book, Vickers of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papers. He, deal, he dealt extensively with this so-called donation of Constantine, this fictitious fraud, this perjury, this lie as the basis for the temporal power of the Pope, the, the so-called donation of Constantine that has never been produced and moreover has been proven by researcher after researcher, historian after historian, and even Popes have admitted that the donation of Constantine was a forgery. Okay? It's one of the undisputed facts of history that is still built upon as though it were valid today. The so-called donation of Constantine. Now, previous to this time, says Dr. Dollinger, quote, there's not a trace to be found of the donation which has since become so famous, unquote. There you have it. Not one hair on the head of this so-called donation of Constantine has ever shown itself. It's a fraud. And he shows that while from time to time many canonists and theologians have maintained its, ver its verity in order to found upon it, quote, a universal dominion of the Pope, unquote, yet that after Baronius, one of the most distinguished of the church analysts pronounced it a forgery, quote, all these voices which had shortly become so numerous and so loud became dumb, unquote. In other words, everybody that propounded the authenticity of this donation of, of Constantine were utterly silenced by the revelation that it was a fiction. The fact is that no writers who have proper regard for their veracity now maintain the truthfulness of this donation of Constantine. The fraud served its purpose during the Middle Ages among an ignorant and superstitious population, but it no longer bears the test of intelligent scrutiny. Dean Millman calls it a, quote, deliberate invention, unquote, a, quote, monstrous fable, unquote, and a, quote, forgery as clumsy as audacious, unquote. Rachel characterizes it as, quote, an ignorant blunder and a falsehood. A falsehood, however, let it be borne in mind, which faithfully reflects the thoughts and the feelings of the age which gave it birth, unquote. 
to accumulate proofs upon this subject in this inquiring age would seem to be a work of super arrogation. Not only is there nothing in all the concessions of Constantine for which a grant of the most limited temporal jurisdiction can be inferred, but in the edict preserved by Eusebius, he excludes all idea of the kind. The clergy are set apart by it from uh, those engaged in secular employments and admonished to, quote, devote themselves to their proper law, unquote, that is, to discharge their ecclesiastical and priestly, and priestly functions. He had, according to Sozomen, entrusted them with the most important offices under the government after he won the Roman scepter in return for their assistance to him. But it is evident from what he said of them in their epistle given by Eusebius about their disgraceful and detestable variances with each other that he found it necessary to prohibit their further intermeddling with temporal affairs and to take upon himself as emperor the assembling of a council to heal their dissensions. It must be remembered that Constantine did not reside at Rome. At the time he took possession of the empire, he passed, says Gibbons, quote, no more than two or three months in Rome, which he visited twice during the remainder of his life to celebrate the solemn festivals of the 10th and the 20th years of his reign, unquote. After relieving the city from the cruel tyranny of Maxentius, he abolished the Praetorian guards to prevent the recurrence of abuses, but, quote, he made no innovation in the government or the magistracy and offices and abrogated no laws except such as were useless and unjust, unquote, restoring as it was, as it was shown by an inspiration upon a public statue, quote, the Senate and the people of Rome to their ancient splendor, unquote. In other words, he didn't change anything. He just overthrew the cruel and tyrannical Maxentius. And he left the existing government as it was. He didn't donate or confer upon the Bishop of Rome one whit of temporal power. He kept it all to himself. And the temporal offices that he bequeathed to Roman Catholic bishops for a time were withdrawn because of infighting among the priests. And they were simply kicked out of the temporal realm for their insolence. And they were given the proper tasks of just being priests. If Constantine did anything, he diminished the power of the priests of the Roman Church. Now, R.W. Thompson continues, he said, It is evident, therefore, that in his absence from Rome, remember he lived in Constantinople, while engaged in prosecuting his wars, he left the temporal government just as he found it, which entirely forbids the idea of any temporal authority having been conferred upon the Pope. He merely tried the experiment of admitting the clergy into the magistracy, but soon repented of this. What he did in that direction was far more calculated to excite ambition than piety, and subsequent history shows that it did lead to those corruptions which carried the church, the Roman church, far away from its so-called apostolic purity. We've discovered that Constantine, after the Roman church helped him overthrow Maxentius, that he ingratiated himself to these priests by allowing them positions in the government, okay, kind of setting a precedent that would plague humanity for nearly two millennia. <laughs> he allowed those priests to occupy heavy political offices, and they were more trouble than they were worth. So he rightly kicked them out. Kicked them out of every government office. <laughs> what a novel idea. I hope my listeners don't mind if I have just a little fun with that. Wouldn't it be great if our government did the same thing? 
recognized these priests as more trouble than they're worth and kicked them out of government offices, kick out the Jesuit advisors from the caucuses and from the uh, conventions and from the private discussions behind closed doors in the Congress and in the White House and in the Supreme Court and in every government agency. What a wonderful thing. The New World Order would be a smoking hole in the ground. The Pope would have no temporal power in the, po in the country that God's people could raise to their proper place in this country, led and taught by the Holy Spirit and governing them li their lives according to God's will and not the will of wicked, sinful men. What an answer to a most perplexing problem, a problem that has existed in the world for nearly two millennia. You'd think that God's people would wake up by now. That's what we ought to do. Kick every Roman Catholic priest out. They are agents of a hostile foreign potentate, the Pope of Rome, who claims by divine right to rule the world. And they are little by little corrupting our government, and turning us all into vassals and slaves for the Pope, restoring the Middle Ages to the 21st century, the New World Order. It's simply the Old World Order restored. I think our government should take example from Constantine and get out the big iron boot and kick all the Jesuits back to Rome where they belong. Now I'll continue with the book since I've had my little entertainment there. Why providence permitted such consequences to follow is beyond all human comprehension. We can no more fathom the mysteries and the plan of the divine government than we can give sensibility to a grain of sand. Life abounds in enigmas with limitations and conditions which nothing but omnipotent wisdom could have imposed, and he who attempts to measure them by standards of human knowledge will find impediments at every step which his sagacity cannot overleap. The naturalist may watch the germ from its first springing into life to the full maturity of a flower and trace out all the stages of its existence with truthful accuracy. And the scientist may gather from the earth, the ocean, and the rocks evidences of time marked out by lines of growth as age is marked by furrows upon the human face. But in the entire panorama of being, there is everything to show, from the minutest to the grandest scenes in nature, and in the origin, growth, and downfall of governments, that God is the omnipresent sovereign, and that his providences are past finding out. He is everywhere present in history. Yet he has given man his intelligent superiority over all other created beings, that he may work out results within the compass of his power for the divine honor of his own good. That he designed from the beginning the ultimate triumph of virtue over vice, of truth over falsehood, and of Christian humility over ambition and selfishness, the infidel may deny with his lips, but cannot doubt in his heart. But it was no part of his infinite plan that this victory should be won in a day, a year, or a century, or that his son, when he mingled in the affairs of the world, robed in our humanity, would have thrown down all the altars of paganism and established his universal kingdom on the earth. Instead of this, he lived and ministered long enough to set an example of perfect purity to man and left his gospel in charge of his apostles, that its precepts might teach mankind those principles of truth, justice, and morality, and charity, which nature, without revelation, does not teach. The apostles began their work by establishing the church, first at Jerusalem, then at Antioch, and then at other places throughout Asia, where the Jew, with or without circumcision, entered into the fold leaving the Gentile world yet without the knowledge of the word. 
From these beginnings, Christianity was carried to Rome, where the foundation of a new church was laid under the preaching of Paul, over which he watched for two whole years in his own hired house. Here it continued to exist without spot or blemish until worldly ambition crept into the flock when Constantine tempted it by gifts of office and money and property and power. Then the grand consummation of the Christian triumph was postponed. Rome had already held the pagan world in subjugation, and her bishops and clergy, tempted by the remembrance of her former greatness, were not content to rest in their career of ambition until all the primitive churches were brought down in humiliation at their feet. When this was accomplished, stimulated and emboldened by their first success, they reached out to grasp the scepter of the world. Let me read that again. When this was accomplished, when they subjected all the other churches, stimulated and emboldened by their first success, they reached out to grasp the scepter of the world. That's the new world order. That's the old world order after having subjected all, subjugated all the churches, they rose to world supremacy. And history records this. R.W. Thompson is telling it straight. And it says, Who can tell how much the nations have been impeded in their march of progress by these events? But for them the world might have escaped the blight and paralysis of the Middle Ages and have pursued an unbroken and unchecked course of advancement from the beginning of Christianity. And, ins and instead of now lamenting the loss of all her temporal power, and mourning to see her Pope sitting again among scattered, er, excuse me, sitting among scattered and fallen columns without a crown upon his head, the Church of Rome might, might have held today such a place in the affections of mankind as would made her as would have made her word in spiritual things the universal guide to human conduct now that's the end of the chapter and i want to conclude that chapter by reiterating something that i often have to i have to remind my listeners even r w thompson it is inferred by what he writes in this book believes that the church at Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, is the modern progression of the church that Paul established in Rome. And that somehow it got corrupted by the papacy and by greedy power mongers that took over that church. I do not believe that. I believe the most accurate the most truthful representation of that church that Paul uh, established in Rome is not the Roman Catholic Church at all. He started the true church of Jesus Christ in Rome, and it was the Roman Catholic Church that called itself Christian that was established not by Paul, but by Simon the sorcerer, Simon Peter, Simon Pater, as he was called, a Babylonian sorcerer. And it has literally become the namesake of Simon the Simoniac. The Roman Catholic Church is that church started by Simon the sorcerer. And it persecuted the true church of Jesus Christ established by Paul. And that the true church of Jesus Christ, because of this persecution, was wiped out. And those who survived fled to the Alps. And for the justification of this, a very scholarly work, a very historically accurate work, an astute work of intense historical and Bible study is found in the work entitled Simon, the Sor uh, Simon Peter Meets Simon the Sorcerer. And you'll find it on my website on research books. 
and I invite all my listeners to go to the website and read that, I make the distinction between the Roman Catholic Church and the true Church of Jesus Christ. There is no Christian foundation for the Roman Catholic Church. Just as there was no Christian foundation for Simon Magus, Simon the Sorcerer, Simon the Babylonian Priest, Simon the Pater, or Simon the Peter, he was literally confused by the people of Rome with, the, with Simon Peter of Jerusalem, the Apostle. And the book of Acts, chapter 4, records... Is it 4 or 8? Chapter 8, I believe, records the first meeting of the apostle with his nemesis, his antichrist nemesis, a pretender that sought to buy the power of God with money. That is the church that Simon Magus started in Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. And it, it, it bears his character even today. The Church of Simony, the Church of Magic, Mystery, and the Mystery Religions, it is not Christianity at all. No matter how many times they repeat it, it cannot be the Church of Jesus Christ. God's people have always been persecuted. And no one has persecuted God's people more than the Roman Catholic Church. And that persecution is about to be rekindled right here in Protestant America. And it's my hope that through the reading of this and other books that God's people in America become aware of what Rome, the persecuting church of Simon Magus, has in store for true Bible-believing Christians right here in this country. Now, chapter 9 of the book, Argument of Archbishop Kenrick. We're going to talk more about him. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the same power conferred on all the apostles. That's right, Peter wasn't special. Yes, Peter was notable, but Peter was not conferred with any special power nor was he the rock and foundation of the church. That is Christ. And we're going to talk about the Roman church, not the first church established. Ancient churches equal. Leo I, great and ambitious. We're going to talk about Leo I, Leo the Great. It's, it's, it's very important information. His interview with Attila and Genseric, the persecution of Priscillian, Rival popes, yes, they all fought for the chair of Peter. Belisarius seized Rome and made Vigilius pope. Pope Severius put to death. Vigilius and Justinian, the three chapters, and popes elected with emperor's consent. And then finally, Gregory I. It's a busy chapter, and it's very important information. I hope you'll stay tuned. Now, it is, uh, the author says it has been already seen that Archbishop Kenrick has treated the question of the Pope's temporal power with more fairness than is commonly among his defenders. This was to have been expected on account of his superior learning and was alike due to the intelligence of the age and to his own Christian character. He does not grope about like a blind man, as many of the papal writers do, amidst the fabulous obscurity of early centuries, to hunt for influences which have nothing but the imagination to support them, and so torture them that they may appear like facts. Nor does he pretend, as Pope Pius IX and the Jesuits do, that the temporal power was divinely conferred on Peter, that it is of, quote, necessity, unquote, and therefore has always existed since Christ established his church. Yet even he, with all his acknowledged sagacity, has not entirely escaped the Jesuit snare. For after telling us that the disciples had, quote, no dominion over the least spot of the earth, unquote, and that Peter had, quote, none of the appendages of royalty, unquote, given him, he proceeds immediately to say that, quote, 
he had powers of a supernatural order for the government of men in order to salvation, unquote. The critic might justly say that the distinguished archbishop has here fallen into what the lawyers call a non sequitur, for it is by no means a legitimate inference to say that because Christ left Peter without temporal dominion, therefore he conferred supernatural powers of government upon him. Our present inquiries, however, are of a more serious and important character. What idea he intended to convey by, quote, powers of a supernatural order, unquote, is not clear. And such power must necessarily exceed all natural power and can only exist miraculously. Its possessor must be able to alter the laws of nature. Was it therefore given to Peter to be exercised in spirituals alone or in temporals also? or in spirituals of so comprehensive a nature as to include temporals. In whatsoever degree it was conferred, it was the power to work miracles, and as such was possessed by all the other apostles equally with Peter. When Christ ordained the twelve and sent them forth to preach, he gave them all, quote, power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils, unquote. And as they went through the towns of Galilee, they perplexed Herod, the Tetrarch, by healing everywhere. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles on the day of Pentecost. Peter healed the impotent man in the temple, and Philip worked miracles in Samaria. And when Paul and Barnabas went into Iconium, Paul called the lame man of Lystra to leap up and walk. And God wrought, spiritual, uh, wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul at Ephesus. And other evidences abundantly show that miraculous gifts were conferred upon all the apostles. Then, if by the fact of imparting supernatural powers, Christ designed that they should be employed, quote, for the government of men in order to salvation, unquote, There was no special designation of Peter for that purpose any more than any of the other apostles. They were all equal in the possession of the power, and as whatever authority they had had, must have arisen out of it, they were equal in authority also. To select Peter, therefore, as the sole custodian of the supernatural power in illustration of the authority of the Pope over temporals is, to say the least of it, an evasion of the question. That he had such power is not denied by any except those who reject revelation, but that it was given him for interference with the temporal affairs of government is shown by no part of the divine record, nor can it be uh, inferred from what was done by him or any of the other apostles in their ministries. If Christ had designed such interference, he would have indicated it by some example of his own. And if he had intended to establish a church of Rome founded alone upon Peter, and with a distinct organization to be maintained by supernatural power, he would have conferred such power alone upon Peter and not upon the other apostles also. If the possession of supernatural power gave authority to establish the church, and this power was possessed by all the apostles alike, then the churches at Jerusalem and Antioch and other places in Asia which preceded that of Rome, antedated the Roman church in the possession of the power to govern men in order to, in order to salvation. And then also the churches established by Paul at Corinth and Ephesus and other places stood upon a precise equality as it, re, it regards authority and jurisdiction with that of Rome, even if it conceded that the latter was established by Peter. Christ gave to neither of them precedence over the other, nor over any other of the apostles. Whether either of them, in establishing a church, intended to transfer to it the supernatural power which he possessed to be preserved throughout all time, 
their records do not instruct us, but that either one transferred more of such power than the other, or that Peter was the only one who transferred any at all, is a proposition which may be dogmatically asserted as it is, but cannot be maintained by argument. Therefore, when Christ said, Upon this rock I will build my church, he meant to declare himself to be the rock upon which each and all the apostolic churches should be founded, with the authority he conferred on all the apostles as the origin of their unity. The unity designed by him was in the beginning, and the beginning proceeds from unity in him, says the eloquent Cyprian, one of the foremost of the fathers and a martyr of the third century. Therefore he continues, quote, Assuredly, the rest of the apostles were also the same as Peter, endowed with a like partnership both of honor and power, and the episcopate is one each part of which is held by each for the whole, unquote. Archbishop Kenrick does not argue this proposition. He merely states it. But it is easy to see that its logical result is this, that if the supernatural power includes authority over temporals because they are embraced by spirituals, then the temporal power was conferred in the act of conferring the spiritual and existed alike from necessity in all the apostolic churches. Inasmuch, therefore, as he had just stated that the temporal power of the Pope was not divinely conferred and undoubtedly means that the supernatural was, his consistency can be maintained in no other way than by setting him down as emphatic authority against the whole Jesuit theory of the temporal patrimony of Peter. It is of no consequence to inquire here how long the supernatural power conferred upon the apostles continued to be possessed by their successors in the work of spreading the gospel whether it ceased with those who came directly in contact with them or with John, the last survivor. For if at the beginning the power was equally possessed by all the apostles and not by Peter alone to the exclusion of the others, it would be absurd and illogical to say that it survived to a single church alone or to the bishop of a single church. That would bring about unity not founded upon Christ, but upon the supernatural power of one apostle. Not a unity of affection, but of compulsion. For none but those who argue falsely will insist that the apostles changed their relations to each other after the crucifixion, or that they, de that they designed that the church they established upon principles of equality should have that equality either destroyed or disturbed. It is sufficient to know now that even the Pope, with infallibility to aid him, has no supernatural power, that he cannot set aside a single law of nature or perform any other miraculous act. Whatever supposed miracles are now attracting the notice and, the exciting, and exciting the devotion of the faithful are attributed to the mother of God, not to the Pope. Did you catch that? Whatever supposed miracles are now attracting the notice and, the ex and exciting the devotion of the faithful, faithful Roman Catholics, are attributed to the mother of God, Mary, not the Pope. It's Mary is the miracle worker in the Roman Catholic Church, not the Pope. She's the supernatural one, not the Pope. And even that is a grievous contravention of the truth. It is a church built on lies, erected on lies, propped up by lies, and continues in lies. It is the counterfeit Antichrist Church, and Satan is its father. 